Hi guys, here's a video going over your chapter 1 test review to help you get prepared for the test. So problems 1, 2, and 3 are asking about domain, and as we talked about in class, the only issues we ever have with domain are when we have radicals and rational expressions. Number 1 is neither of those. It's not a radical, it's not a rational expression, so that means the domain is all real numbers. You can write it one of two ways. You can do the r with a line through it, or you can do the interval from negative infinity up to infinity. For number two, it is a radical, and so we have an issue with radicals because you can't take the square roots of negatives, so that means everything underneath the radical has to be positive, or it can be equal to zero. So I'm taking 2x minus 3, and that has to be greater than or equal to zero. I'm going to solve for x, I'm going to add 3, and then divide by 2. So I get x is greater than or equal to 3 halves, so that's your domain for number 2. For number 3, the issue with rational expressions is that you cannot divide by 0, so that means that denominator cannot equal 0. So I'm going to start by factoring it. That's x minus 5 and x plus 3, and that cannot equal 0. So my first value for x, x cannot be 5, and my second value for x, x cannot be negative 3. So your domain is all numbers except for 5 and negative 3. For 4 and 5, we're using the vertical line test, so that's determining if the graph is a function. So I'm going to go ahead and draw some vertical lines on my graph, and I want to see if those vertical lines touch the graph in more than one spot. If it does not, like for number 4, that means it is a function. For number 5, when I draw a vertical line, my vertical line is touching my graph in two spots. That means it is not a function. What you're looking for for the vertical line test is you're trying to see if every x has only one y. But if you look at this x value, it has two y's. It has one at about uh, 2.8 and then one at about negative 2.8. So that's why it's not a function. For number 6, you're describing the transformation, so each number with that function um, has a transformation. So the negative 3 that's in the very front actually is two transformations. The negative is a reflection over the x-axis, so I'm going to write that down, reflection over the x-axis. The 3 in front, since it is bigger than 1, that is a vertical stretch. Of 3. Now if that 3 was in between 0 and 1, like it was a 1 -third, that would be a vertical compression. The plus 3 on the inside, that means your function is moving to the left 3 units. And then the minus 4 on the outside means the function is moving down 4. So you just need to tell me what you remember to do to the function, what kind of transformation it creates. For number 7, you're doing various function operations. So in letter A, you're doing f plus g of 3. That's the same thing as f of 3 plus g of 3. So I'm going to start by finding f of 3 first. So I'm going to take 3 and plug it into my f function. So I have two negative 2 times 3 squared plus 5. That gives you negative 13. Just plugging it in. I'm going to take g of 3. So I'm going to take 3 and plug it into my g function. So 2 times 3 plus 1 is 7. And then finally, to get my final answer, I'm doing f of 3, which is negative 13, plus g of 7, or g of 3, which was 7, and then that gives you your final answer of negative 6. For letter B, you're doing the same thing, it's just that you're now multiplying. So I'm going to start by taking f of negative 2, so it's f of negative 2 times g of negative 2. So I'm going to start by doing f of negative 2, so I'm going to plug in negative 2 into my f function, that gives me negative 3. I'm going to take g of negative 2, so plug in negative 2 into my g function, that also gives you negative 3. 
So f of negative 2 times g of negative 2 is a positive 9. So you're just taking those numbers and plugging them in and performing the operation. So for letter A, you were adding. For letter B, you were multiplying. For letter C, you're taking the composition. So another way to write this is by doing f of g of 2. So I'm going to start by finding g of 2 first. So I'm going to take 2, plug it into my g function. That gives me 5. And now that becomes the input for my next function. So now I'm going to take f of 5. So if I take 5 and plug it into my f function, that gives me negative 45. And then that's your final answer. For letter D, you're doing the composition again, but now you're working with straight functions instead of numbers. So I have g of f of x. So that means I'm doing g of whatever f of x is, which is negative 2x squared plus 5. So now this negative 2x squared plus 5 becomes the input into my g function. So that, excuse me, so that equals 2 times negative 2x squared plus 5 plus 1. So I'm going to distribute the 2. That gives you negative 4x squared plus 10 plus 1, and then combine your like terms. So negative 4x squared plus 11. So you're taking that function and plugging it into the other function. For number 8, we're finding the inverse. It's a four-step process. So I'm going to start by changing f of x to y. So I have y equals 3x minus 7. I'm going to switch my x and my y. So that leaves me with x equals 3y minus 7. And then step 3 is to actually solve for y. So I'm going to add 7 to both sides. Divide by 3. So that leaves me with y equals x plus 7 divided by 3. And then step 4 is just to write it back in function notation. So it was an f function, so I have f inverse of x equals x plus 7 divided by 3. Sorry, my handwriting's getting pretty bad on here. But there you go. Um, number 9 deals with the variations. So it says w varies directly as z and inversely as the square root of u. If z equals 2, u equals 9, and then w equals 6. So express the statement as a formula that involves the given variables with a constant of proportionality k. So you're just writing the formula. So it says w varies directly as z and inversely as the square root of u. So that is a joint variation. So I have my k, because you always have a k. And direct variation is on top, so multiplying by k. And then inverse variation you're dividing by. So that is your formula for letter A. For letter B, you're actually finding the value of k, and the way that you do that is by plugging in these numbers. So w is 6 when z is 2 and u is 9. So I can go ahead and simplify what I have. So I have 6 equals 2k over 3 since the square root of 9 is 3. I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by 3. That gives me 18 equals 2k. Divide by 2 and then you get k equals 9. So your constant of proportionality for number 9 is 9. Um, number 10, doing the same thing. So the intensity of illumination, I, from the source of light, varies inversely as the square of the distance from its source. So we want to write the formula. So it's inverse variation. So I have I equals K divided by D squared. Because inverse variation, you're dividing. A searchlight has an intensity of 1 million candle power at a distance of 50 feet. Find the value of k in part a. So I have my intensity, which is 1 million, so that goes in for i. And my distance was 50 feet, so 50 squared. So that gives me 1 million equals k over... Uh, 2,500, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by 2,500, and I get k equals a very, very large number. How many zeros do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
25 with eight zeros. There we go. So there's your K, pretty large K. So that's fine, we can work with it. And then part C was to solve the problem. So approximate the intensity of a searchlight in B at a distance of one mile. So the units that we used for part B was in feet. So we also need to have part C in feet as well. So one mile is equivalent to 5,280 feet. So I'm trying to find I. My K is 25 with eight zeros. divided by 5,280 squared. I'm going to take that and plug the whole thing into my calculator. And you get about 89.68. And then our units for intensity was in candle power. We got that from letter B. So it's 89.68 candle power. Don't forget your units. All right. Now the next part uses that single graph to answer a lot of questions. So the first thing you're looking at is the domain of F. So the domain you're trying to see what's happening horizontally. So how far your graph goes to the left and how far it goes to the right. So the furthest that it goes to the left is at negative four. The furthest that it goes to the right is at positive nine. So your domain goes from negative four to nine. Now if you look at this graph, um, you do have endpoints at both of the ends, but if these were arrows, that would change the problem a little bit, because then your domain would be all real numbers from negative infinity to infinity. So just pay attention once you get your test, if they have endpoints at the ends or if they have arrows. The range, you're looking at how high or how low your graph goes. So the lowest that your graph goes is to negative four, and the highest that your graph goes is to positive four. So your range goes from negative four to positive four. For number 13, finding f of zero. So the, whatever is in that parenthesis, that's your x. So I'm gonna go to my graph. I'm gonna see when my x is zero. What's that corresponding y value? And that's four. So f of zero is equal to four. Number 14, for what values of x is f of x equal to zero? So this is kind of a flip-flop of number 13. So now I'm giving you the y value equals zero, and we need to find the corresponding x values. So when the y is zero, there are your x values. So it ends up being your x-intercepts. So that is at negative two positive 2, and 5. I'm going to go ahead and erase these dots. Okay. Um, for number 15, over what intervals is f of x greater than or equal to 0? So greater than or equal to 0 is above the x-axis. So you're looking at this piece and this piece. Now for your first piece, that interval starts at negative 2, and it ends at positive 2. And since it can equal 0, we're going to go ahead and use brackets. So negative 2 to 2. If it just said greater than 0, you would use parentheses. And then we do have two intervals, so don't forget your union. And then your second interval goes from positive 5 up to 9. So 5 to 9. And both of those intervals together is going to give you the solution to 15. I'm going to go ahead and erase before I do the next problem. There we go. Um, for number 16, find the intervals for which f of x is increasing. So again, you're traveling along your graph. So anytime you're going up, that's increasing. Anytime you're going down, that's decreasing. And then I'm going back up. So I have two intervals for increasing. The first one starts at negative 4 and ends at 0. The second one starts at 3 and ends at 9. So I have negative 4 to 0 and 3 to 9. 
Now for increasing, decreasing, you always use parentheses because technically at those endpoints you're not decreasing and you're not increasing. And then that green piece in the middle goes from 0 to 3, and then that's the part where you are decreasing. And then for number 18, find any relative max or mins. So those are your peaks. Let me erase this. So that right there is a max, and that right there is a minimum. So I have a maximum at 0, 4, and a minimum at 3, negative 2. So your max is your top hump, and your minimum is your bottom hump. All right. The last part deals with what we did on the calculators with regression. So you do need a graphing calculator for number 19, um, and you do not, you will not have the directions for the test, so that's something you need to familiarize yourself with um, before you actually take the test. So the data table on the right shows the number of hours a student spent studying for the SAT and the resulting math scores. So in your calculators, you're going to start by hitting STAT, and then go over to Edit, this right here, you're going to put into L1, and that is going to go into L2. Once you have all of your data in, and double check that you put it in correctly, what you're going to do next is you're going to hit STAT, move over to CALC, and we're trying to find a linear regression model that best fits this data. So that's option number four. So once you do that, you're going to go down to calculate, and then the equation that the calculator is going to give you is y equals 25.33x plus 353.16. And now that we have an equation, we can actually use the equation to answer some questions. So it says use the model to predict the score of a student that studied for 15 hours. So since x is the hours, I'm going to go ahead and take 15 and plug it in for x. Oops, I don't know why I put an equal sign. I'm going to take that expression and plug it into my calculator, and it gives you about 733. So that would be the SAT score on the math portion for someone that studied for 15 hours. For letter C, it says use the model to determine how many hours a student studied if their score was 720. So instead of me giving you the hours, I'm now giving you the score. So the score is your Y. So I'm going to go ahead and put 720 in for y. What was that? I don't know why I put a 3. So 25.33x plus 353.16. Whoops. And then now I'm going to solve for x. So I'm going to start by subtracting 353.16 from both sides. That gives me 366.84 equals 25.33x divide by 25.33 and you get x is about 14.5 hours. Okay, so if a student studied for 100 hours, what would their expected score on the math SAT be? So I'm going to take 100 and plug it in for x and see what we get. So I have 25.33 times 100 plus 353.16, that gives me y equals 2,886. Now, it does say to explain this answer. So this answer makes absolutely no sense whatsoever because the highest that you can, the highest that you can score on the math portion of the SAT is 800. So the, math, the model that we have is good up until a certain point. So studying for 100 hours is not necessarily going to get you a score of 288.6. So then this number doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense in the context of the problem. All right, so that covers every problem on your Chapter 1 test review. I hope this video helps you get prepared for the test. Good luck studying!